She was tall and strong, beautiful and clever. And her name was Yetzin. What was her name? Yetzin. Tall? Yetzin. No, just tall. Tall and strong, handsome and clever. And she lived in a great house with her father. Now her father was called Wan. Now father, her father, well he was a warlord, like a king. But he did not have a kingdom. He had a sword in his hand. Well done you. He had a sword in his hand. And he made sure that everyone who lived in that area did as they were supposed to do. He would give them gold. Can you do that with me? He would give them gold. He would give them silver. He would give them a roof above their head and food inside of their bellies. But I'll tell you this. Wan was very sad because his wife had died. His wife had died so many years before, and I'll tell you this. Yetzin, tall, do it. Tall, strong, beautiful and clever. She thought that she would try and make sure that her father, Wan, would have a smile upon his lips, and she did this. She found that there was a woman. Can you do that with me? She found that there was a woman. She was beautiful and she had her own daughter. This woman would smile. This woman would look beautiful. But I will tell you something. This woman's heart was like a stone inside of her chest. Now you might have noticed that I have an accent. So when I say stone, I want you to say stone the same way as I say it. You ready after three? One, two, three. <laughs> Is that what I sound like? I'll tell you this. They were there in that place, and as soon as she got married, she came into Wan's great house. You should be doing this with me. Wan's great house. And in that place, as soon as they were there, she would look at her husband and would say, My husband. Can you do that with me? She would say, My husband. Now, I see that your daughter. Yet Sien has a huge room, a large room, and my daughter's room is very small. Please. Do that with me. Please. Can you make sure that your daughter Yet Sien moves out of that room and my daughter can live in her room? Now Wan was very frightened. He did not want to upset or make sad his new wife. But he did not know what to do. And he went to Yetzin and said, oh, my daughter. What did he say? My daughter. It was deeper than that. My daughter. My daughter. You do that so well. I'll tell you this. He looked and he said, please, Yetzin, could you move out of your room and let your sister live inside of yours? And quicker than a wink or a blink of an eye. You are so slow. Quicker than a wink or a blink of an eye. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> Quicker than a wink or a blink of an eye. <laughs> Quicker than a wink or a blink of an eye. She moved out of that room. And do you think that her new mother was happy? <sighs> no. Can you do that with me? <sighs> no. She looked and she said, My husband. Can you do that with me? My husband. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I would wish to have water to wash my face and my hair. Well done you. To wash my face and my hair. Can your daughter, Yetzin, go and fetch me water? Wan did not know what to say or to do, but he went to his daughter and said, My daughter, do it. My daughter. Please, would you fetch water for your new mother? And quicker than a, a heartbeat, Yetzin said, Of course I will. And every morning before the sun would rise, well done at the back there. And every morning before the sun would rise, she would go to the river and pick up the water and pour it out in front of her new mother. Do you think that she was happy? No. She said, now when her husband was not there, the way that she looked changed. She did not look beautiful. She would place her teeth together she would grit and grind the words from out of her mouth and she would say, this water is not cold enough. Do it. This water is not cold enough. This water is not sweet enough. Go and fetch me the water before the sun rises. 
and you have sin. We'll have to get out of the bed, fetch the water, and bring it in. Do you think she was happy? No. And she said, with a sweet voice and face, do it with me. My husband. Please. <laughs> I wish to have the water really early in the morning. Can yet sin move out of the house and live in a cave by the side of the river? One did not know what to say, but he said, My daughter. What did he say? My daughter. Please, will you move out of the house and into the cave? And quicker than a wink or a blink of an eye, I'm watching. Quicker than a wink or a blink of an eye, she moved into a dark and damp cave. She would fetch the water and bring it in. Do you think that that wicked woman was happy? No. She said, a voice that was as sweet as honey, she said, My husband. You do that so well. My husband, please. <laughs> I want your daughter to fetch the water from the top of the mountain. Inside there is another cave. Inside there is a lake. And I would want her to fetch the water and a great golden bucket. Can you do that with me? It's a G for gold and it shines. With a great golden bucket. One had to tell his daughter, but yet Sin said she would do it. And as she picked up the buckets, you are so good at this. As she picked up the buckets, they were heavy before there was water inside. And the path that led to the top of the mountain was covered in small, sharp stones. Stones that cut at her feet and the blood dripped between her toes. Now I've got your interest. And this is the thing. She staggered to the top. And when she got to the top, Inside of the cave, <coughs> it was so dark that she picked up the water and came down the mountain and poured all of the water out. Do you think that this wicked wife was happy? No. Yes, she was indeed. She was happy. She could see that her feet were cut. She could see the blood upon the tips of her toes. But one day, yet seen, before the sun had arisen, staggered up to the top of the mountain, gathered up the water, and inside of the cave, where it was so dark, she listened and she could hear singing. Beautiful singing. You are so good at this. But she looked, and as her eyes were used to the dark, she saw that there was a fish. Now this fish was no bigger than your small finger. It was half in the water, and half out of the water, and she saw it, and she heard it, and she picked it up, and she put it into one of the buckets, and when she picked them up, they were light, they were not heavy. She smiled. She could almost dance right down the whole of the mountain, but she was not going to give this fish to that wicked wife. She took it out. She put it into a bowl. And she went inside and still, with a smile on her lips, she poured the water out. And the woman looked and said, why do you smile? But yet Sin said nothing. This woman was very curious, because every morning she smiled, and she would not tell. But I'll tell you this, this fish that was once as small as your little finger, soon was as wide as your hand, soon was as long as your arm. And every morning, yet Sin would go, and she would say, Oh fish, oh beautiful fish, sing a song for me. Can you repeat that for me, please? Oh fish, oh beautiful fish, sing a song for me. And the buckets would not be heavy. And every day she smiled, and this wicked woman wanted to find out what put a smile upon her lips. And one day she hid behind a tree. Well done you, you're very good at this. She hid behind a tree and she watched and she saw and she thought to herself, if she says, oh fish, oh beautiful fish, 
that fish shall sing for me. And when she watched Yetzin go up the mountain, she stood there by the side of the river and said, Oh fish, oh beautiful fish, sing a song for me. And the fish would not come to the top of the water. So she <clears throat> cleared her throat and said, oh, oh, oh fish, oh beautiful fish, sing a song for me. And the fish came up and out of the water and started to sing. But when it looked at her hair and it looked at her face, it knew it was not yet sin and it swam away. If that fish will not sing for me because of the way that I look, I shall borrow yet sin's clothes. And she spoke to this daughter. She said, my sweet daughter, in a voice that yet sin had never heard before, and said, my daughter, please, you have a thin coat upon your back. Please take mine. It is beautiful. It is thick. It is warm and made of silk and wool. Yet Sien could not believe her eyes. She gave over her old ragged coat and put on her wicked mother's coat and went up the mountain. And with this ragged coat upon her back, she stood there with her back to the water and said, Oh! Oh, fish! Oh, beautiful fish! Sing a song for me. Now the fish came up to the top of the water. It looked and saw this coat made of silk and of wool, and it started to sing more and more. But when the woman turned around, the fish swam away. If that fish will not sing for me, it shall not sing for anyone. And she stood again. Do it with me. Ready? Oh, fish. Oh, beautiful fish. Sing a song for me. And the fish came up to the top of the water. She came closer to the edge of the water. And here she reached inside of the cuff of the coat and pulled out a long, thin, sharp, silvered blade. And as the fish was singing, she stuck it straight, deep into the heart of the fish. And as the fish struggled there, dying, its blood mixing with the water, she smiled. If you will not sing for me, you shall not sing for anyone. And that night, she cooked the fish and said to Yeti, Give me back my coat. Can you do that with me? Ready? Give me back my coat. Yetzin put on her old ragged coat, but the woman looked and said, Would you wish to come and eat with us inside of the house? Yetzin thought to herself to be invited to come back inside of the house. And she came and she sat, and as she was about to eat some of the fish, she could not place it upon her lips, teeth, and tongue. There was something about it. She ran out. And as she stood by the side of the river, she spoke. Oh, fish. Oh, beautiful fish. Everybody do that with me. Oh, fish. Oh, beautiful fish. Please sing a song for me. And the fish could not come to the top of the water. She started to cry. A long, thin, salty tear ran from the cheek and chin and fell from the tip of her chin like a diamond into the water. It made a great ripple in that mirror of the river. And as she rubbed her eyes and looked, she saw that standing beside her was an old man. He put his arm about her shoulder. His hair, long and thin, hung over his shoulders. His beard, long and thin, hung upon his chest. And he said, Yes, Yin, your fish loved you very much. But now it is dead. <gasps> She could not believe her eyes that a wicked mother had done this thing. But at the back of the house, there are its bones. And if you pick them up and take one of those bones, get a hold of a bone, I guess, and you would say a wish for yourself and a wish for someone else. Can you do that with me? A wish for yourself and a wish for someone else. It will come true. She rubbed her eyes. She thought that the old man was a fool, but when she looked, he had gone. 
But she went to the back of the house, and there lay the bones, and she gathered them up, and the wicked stepmother stood there and said, Ah, oh, are you going to make some soup with the bones of your beautiful fish, oh, beautiful fish? And yet Sien said nothing. Can you do that with me? Yes, Sien said. And she went into a cave, get a hold, like this. And she said, I would wish that there was a door to this cave, and I would wish that there would be a fire in everyone's house that never went out. No sooner had she said it than it was done. You are so good. She wished for, do it, one thing for herself and one thing for someone else. And every day, always, do it with me, one thing for herself and one thing for someone else. Soon she had fine clothes, she had good food, but everyone who lived in that village lived very well. Always she wished for them. But there was a king, put a crown on your head. There was a king, <laughs> and he heard of this beautiful woman, and he sailed for three days across the sea, and when he looked at Yet Sien, he fell desperately in love. You're supposed to go. He fell desperately in love. Too many telly novellas. Okay? And he looked. Uh, and he said, I would wish for you to come with me across the sea and live in my great castle. And they sailed. And he noticed that inside of the castle there were new things, new good things. For when he fell asleep, When he fell asleep, yet Sin would creep down the stairs and wish, ready, one thing for herself, everybody, one thing for herself and one thing for someone else. And one night he crept down and he peeked from behind the curtain and he watched. She picked up a, a bone in her hand and she said, I would wish that there would be a table inside of the castle that always has food for visitors. He smiled. This is a good thing. <laughs> and he, as he whispered it, she turned to look. And he ran upstairs and pretended to be asleep. He saw her wish for one thing for herself. He did not see her wish for something for someone else. The next morning he looked and said, that, My wife, you have not seen your father Wan for such a long time. You must travel across the sea and visit him. And yet Sin smiled. And she did travel. And on the first night that she was gone, he went downstairs and grabbed one bone and said, I cannot do this. These do not belong to me. The second night he picked up and went, I still cannot do this. But the curiosity was inside of his heart. And on the third night, he picked up a bone. Do it. He picked up a, I said, do it. <laughs> he picked up a bone and said, I would wish that all of this castle would be made of gold and brick by brick, stone by stone, window by window and door, all turned to gold. And he wished for one thing for himself. And nothing more. He wrapped up the bones, smiled. And when Yip Xin returned, she could see the castle, and it looked, and it glittered and gleamed like stars in the night. She ran. She said, my husband, please tell me that you have not used those bones, the wishing bones. He said, I did, and I wished for this great golden castle. Please tell me that you wished for one thing for yourself and one thing for someone else. He said, no. I watched you, and you wished for the table. She ran, she got the bones, and she said, I would wish that the windows would be made of diamonds, and that no one would ever be sick in this town. Nothing. She picked another, and still nothing. Now, her husband, the king, fell to his knees, oh please, I am sorry. I did not know that I had to do this. She was calm, she was quiet, 
She said, my husband, you must travel. Do this with me, everybody. From the top of the world to the bottom of the world, from the side of the world and all around. And by every piece of water, we must stand and try and find that fish. And so they travelled, show me, together, hand in hand, the top of the world, the bottom of the world, the side of the world, and all around. And one day they had been doing it for so long, it was almost as if you could see through their bodies. She said, my husband, I will travel by the light of the moon, and you shall travel by the light of the sun, and we shall stand and try and find that fish. And to this day, if you stand there by the side of a river and the moon is in the sky, you might see the figure and form of a woman. And as the water laps backwards and forwards, do it with me now. As the water goes backwards and forwards, you might hear, oh fish, oh beautiful fish, sing a song for me. Everybody do it with me. Oh, beautiful fish, he saved a song And that's why the Japanese think that when you stand by the side of a sea and the waves go backwards and forwards, or by the side of a river and you hear the water, you can hear the sound of Ye Tsien and her husband. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So here we go. No returning home. I was so excited to see my family. Eddie also came, and he came with his family. I got so excited that I fainted. When I woke up, my family was dressed like Kensuke, and Eddie was playing football with Kensuke and my mom. My dad was playing with Kikambo and some other babies. I stood up and went out to see my father. What happened to everything? Uh, why are you, why are we not at home? My father said that he thought that if we went home, we wouldn't have enough money for school and food. So he asked Kensuke if we could all live here, and we agreed. About a year passed, and we started getting used to everything. The fishing, the killer, is it killer men? Killer, killer men coming, and we protected the orangutans and how to get fruits, but one day when we were out getting the fruits, Kensuke wasn't with us anymore. So we started looking for him everywhere. We called and searched for him, but he was nowhere to be seen. That night, when I was going to bed, I heard a strange noise. It was Kensuke. I, I cried for people to gather. He seemed hurt and lost. He said that he had fallen off a banana tree and stumbled to his cave. By the time he finished, I realized he was dying. I started crying until I fell asleep. When I woke up, my whole bed was filled with tears. I went to see what really had happened and saw that the orangutans and my parents were burying Kensugi. Eddie was also there. I went to my mom and she handed me a note. I am dead now and I make you head of the clan. Please take care of them. Yours truly, Kensuke. Whoever wrote that, that was absolutely fantastic, wasn't it? I think that deserves a little round of applause. Well, one of the things... Miguel, stand up, please. Where's Miguel? There he is. Well, John, you Bad, and you would find it inside of the old town. She did not care what she did, but in the middle of the town there was a tree. But this tree was covered all over with gold. And I'll tell you something, the animals would come to that place, and the animals would scrape and scratch, and they would roll it and make it into small pieces of gold. And they would give it to those that they had watched, that they thought deserved it. And they would pull the gold and give it to an old woman who was hungry, who was cold, so that they could buy clothes for their back. But this girl thought to herself, I deserve this the most. And she would sit, 
She would sit down upon a chair. She would wait and watch. And she would sit by the side of that tree. And she would sit and she would pretend. She would go, oh, I have no food inside of my belly. And she would sit with an empty cup. She would go, oh, I wish that people would give me money. I wish that I could have something to eat. And the monkeys always watched. And she watched them. And they would scrape the gold from the side of the tree. And they would look. And they would give her, give the other people gold. And she would say to herself, and her heart beating in a chest, she would say, I deserve that gold. And one day, she had had nothing to eat. She had had no no, no warm clothing upon her back. And the monkeys had all watched her. And they scraped some of the gold from the very top of the tree. And she looked and she saw it was covered with the sap, with all of the juice uh, inside of the tree. And they rolled it up. And she smiled. And she looked. She held her hand out. I am ready. Please give me the gold. She was given the gold and she wrapped her hands about it. And she thought to herself, now I have the gold. I will try and look at how much they have given me. But as she tried to open her hand, all of the juice, all of the sap, all of the bark had made her fingers tight shut. And now she walks around, a stick in her hand, with a piece of gold locked and trapped inside. And she walks with a stick, always hoping that some day she could give the gold back to the monkeys. And that's a story. Is that a better story than once upon a time there was a razor, a tin, and a pen? Yeah. You're not 100% sure I would go out and buy Harry Potter and the tin of tuna, okay? <laughs> you are sat marvellous before me. We have a little bit of time at the end here, but... At So it goes like this. Don't shout out, they are on board a ship. Do not shout out, there's an iceberg. <laughs> uh, I kind of believe it took three clues. Which one's it from, girl here? Yes, from Titanic. Well, we have. Okay, thank you very much. I did say I would let you ask me some questions because we have another college to go to, so we haven't got much time. But would anybody like to ask me a question about writing stories, telling stories, what kind of stories I tell, or places I go? Yes. My favourite story, I've got to tell you, um, it changes. I haven't told Yet Xin for about a year or, or more, to be honest. And I've got to tell you, I really enjoyed telling it. So, for the moment, that is my favourite story. Yes. A lot of reading. Your teachers are going to say to you forever, I see the whole thing nodding, yes, yes. I'm so pleased he's saying that because I've been saying it for years. Reading is very inspirational. Practice with the language as well. So I try and speak Spanish. I try and tell stories as best as I possibly can in the best way that I can. So, but reading. And even if you read a terrible story, you can turn around and say, I would never write anything as bad as that. I love the fact that the adults have gone, yeah? I've read that book too. Yes? Where have you told stories? Uh, well, I tell stories mostly in uh, Scotland and England, Wales and Ireland. But uh, I was asked two years ago to come to Chile. And we went there uh, two years ago, almost exactly. So I've been to uh, Chile and Colombia and Brazil and Argentina and now, um, now Peru. 
So yeah, I love it. I love your food, by the way. <laughs> Can you tell? Go, go. Here we go. <laughs> Another question, yes? When I was at school, we had uh, we had sort of the same sort of things that you have to do. We'd have almost like writing competitions, and we would have to stand at the front and read them out. And I was quite good at that. So I would win, this is for the English in the audience, I would win a ten and sixpenny postal order. You feel homesick already. <laughs> so I would win. But one last question, the boy at the back there, who's been so, such good fun. You know, what a fantastic question. Do I have any inspirational objects like the forest or the countryside? I've got to tell you, my imagination is always ready to, to, to just to look all of the time. Look at anything and think, who could have that? Where would they have it? What would they do with it? Why and when? I do relax, by the way. I can switch off completely. But I've got to say, I quite like it when at the traffic lights, you have people either juggling or singing or um, you know, just collecting money. And I thought when we went to uh, Chan Chan, I loved the idea of there would be the same sort of thing, that people would not be selling like, um, like uh, chicle or something like that. They'd be selling like roasted, uh, roasted sweet corn. So I'm thinking and working on a story about the same things you have now, but in the past, when it was like the Moche people. You are being fantastic. Hands on chins, do it. You did do it. Go like that, that means thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna throw some thank yous out, you're gonna try and catch them. Some for over there, try and catch them there, you've got them. One for over here, one for you, one for you, over here. But do I not get any? Mm. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you very much.